Now we're going to move on to the final step of this problem, and that we're going to obtain Plancharov's theorem. That means we're going to move from the result from part C all the way to Plancharov's theorem. That means we're going to have to change this term over here into an integral. So now we have a summation sign, but we're going to have to change this into an integral. So in order to do this, first of all, notice that this is actually just a Riemann sum. So in order to understand what a Riemann sum is, we should understand what an integral is. So that is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to move, uh, apply the definition of an integral and try to change this into an integral. So what exactly is an integral? So if you're unfamiliar with what a Riemann sum is, here is a quick example. So let's say I have an integral from x0 to xn dx. So what this means is that this the value of this thing is going to be equal to, so let's say I have this uh, x-axis over here, and then we have x0, x1, x2, all the way to xn. So this integral is essentially taking, first of all, this integral over here. So we first take the length of this integral, which is x1 minus x0. And then we're going to choose a point within this interval. So let's say I choose a point t0. So t0 is going to be some number between x0 and x1. And then I'm going to substitute t0 into the function. And then I'm going to multiply it to the interval. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the next interval. So once again, I take the length, x2 minus x1. And then I multiply it by the function of t1, where t1 is going to be some number between this interval. And then this process just keeps on continuing on and on all the way to xn. And then if we just add up all these different terms, we get our integral. So you can see that if these intervals are large, then whatever t0 or t1 you choose, so t0 could be any any number within this interval, you can see that as uh, if you move between this interval, the, the value of f of t0 is going to change. But then this change is going to be more and more insignificant as the interval becomes smaller and smaller. So that is the idea behind dx. So dx is just an infinitely tiny interval. So the idea of integral is we just repeat this process, but we do it by uh, shrinking this interval into extremely, uh, in infinitely small intervals. So that is exactly uh, essentially the idea behind an interval. And then you can see that this summation over here is actually just doing the exact same thing that we're doing over here. So let's just get rid of this. So if you'll just notice the, the summation that we have here, you can visualize what's going on with a k-axis. So you can imagine this point is k1, k2, k3 all the way to infinity, and then we have k0, uh, k negative 1, k negative 2, and all the way to negative infinity. So this entire thing over here, this is pretty much the exact same thing we were doing for, inter for an integral. So you have this change in k, which is just the interval over here, and then we multiply it by uh, this f of kn e to the power of i Kmx. And for this case, we're just going to, I should put k0 instead of kn. So e to the power of i k0 x. So this term over here, this is just, this just correspond to the, uh, you can just view this entire thing as one function, g of k. So this is pretty much just, you have this interval multiplied by g of k0. So k0 is going to be like the t0 that we considered, where t0 is a number between this interval. So k0 is just a special instance, we're choosing the left-hand interval. And then as you move on with the summation, you can see that we're just doing the exact same thing. So if you substitute n equal to 1, then we have this case over here. Once again, we have the change in k, which is the interval. And then we multiply by this term where we substitute k1. So this is just g of k1. So I should be a bit more clear with this. g of k is, I'm going to define this as f of k times e to the power of I k x. So it's just a shorthand for writing all this. And you can see that this val uh, this process just keeps on repeating all the way to, in to infinity. And then this process also keeps repeating all the way to negative infinity. So you can see that this kind of resembles an integral from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. So the only thing that's stopping this from becoming an interval is that the, the intervals are still too large. So right now the interval change in k is equal to pi over a. And you can see that this is far from a infinitely uh, infinitely small interval. So remember, for integral, we have something like dx. So dx is an infinitely small interval. But right now, pi over a that's actually a pretty large interval. So this is not quite an integral uh, an interval yet. 
So in order to change this into an integral, we need to make sure that our intervals are infinitely small. And we can do that by taking the limit when a becomes a uh, tends to infinity. So when a tends to infinity, you can see that the interval is going to be infinitely small. And then you can see that this will co exactly correspond to a definition of an integral. So when a tends to infinity, f of x, due to the definition of an integral, is going to be become something like this. So when a uh, tends to infinity, we no longer need to put a subscript over here because a essentially becomes a continuous, uh, continuous variable. So before uh, a, uh, k was a discrete, it was rather discrete. So you have n equal to one, n equal to two, and the values just uh, keep on increasing step by step. All right. But now if we change a, uh, if a tends to infinity, the interval is going to be so small that this essentially the k essentially changes into a continuous uh, continuous variable. So as a tends to infinity, this whole thing here becomes an integral. And then it could be rewritten as something like this. So this is what this is the essence of Plantrell's theorem. That your f of x can be rewritten in this form. And then as a tends to infinity, we could also rewrite our f of k. So for this f of k here, we can rewrite it as once again we no longer need the subscript because it is now a continuous continuous variable. So let's just get rid of the subscript. And then as a tends to infinity, the bounds become negative infinity to infinity. So this is the essence of Plantrell's theorem. You can represent f of x using this form, where this f of k is given by this integral over here.